If you want to open your Bible to Mark chapter 12, that's where we will be this evening as we continue uh, through uh, the life of Christ written by the pen of Mark here before us. J.C. Ryle wrote the following, who can tell the misery that unbelief has brought on the world? Unbelief made Eve eat the forbidden fruit. She doubted the truth of God's word, you will surely die. Unbelief made the old world reject Noah's warning and so perish in their sins. Unbelief kept Israel in the wilderness. It was the barricade that kept them from entering the promised land. Unbelief made the Jews crucify the Lord of glory. They did not believe the voice of Moses and the prophets, even though they were read to them every day. And unbelief is the reigning sin of man's heart down to this very hour. Unbelief in God's promises, unbelief in God's wrath and discipline, unbelief in our own sinfulness, unbelief in our own danger, unbelief in everything that runs counter to pride and worldliness of our evil hearts. Unbelief is truly the biggest problem in humanity. J.C. Ryle actually wrote that quote uh, in a book that he wrote for parents called The Duty of Parents. And he wrote it because he wanted parents to understand that they need to continually seek to live out the word of God before their unbelieving children. And the reason he wrote that is, is, is because parents need to remember that their children are naturally unbelieving. And that is why what they do and what they say and what they think is the reason they do what they do in those things. They're unbelieving. Unbelief in Christ and in God's way uh, does not rule their hearts. They rule their own hearts. And this kind of unbelief, as I read a moment ago, does great damage. And so the call to parents from J.C. Ryle is to get the word of God in front of their kids habitually so that they will see the Savior from their sins, so that they will believe in him and and reverse the effects of of unbelief that have damaged this world so greatly. Well, that is a great call for parents, no doubt, but it is also a great call for all believers generally in this world of unbelief. You and I need to go into whatever sphere God has placed us in and put the word of God in front of people, both by our lives and by our proclamation, so that people will stop living in unbelief and rather follow and be devoted to Christ, their only Savior. Now, in order to do now, now uh, in order to do this, we have to see what unbelief looks like. We can't live in muddy waters of what true belief is and what unbelief is, and make it something that it is or is not. And so we have then many texts, but particularly this one in front of us here in Mark 12. The religious leaders confront Jesus to expose him, but Jesus turns it around and ends up exposing their own unbelief. And in this, we get not only a look into our own lives and turn that in on ourselves to see where our hearts truly are, if they are unbelieving or if they are believing. But we also get to see what unbelief truly looks like. And in this way, we are helped by our Lord, both personally and evangelistically, when we talk about true faith and what false faith looks like. It's a very helpful section for us before us. Let me pray, and then we will dive in together. Father, again, we come to your word asking for your help, not just in the simple understanding of the text, but to believe it and to live by it, that you would give us the ability to love your word because we love you. So Spirit, work through your word that you have written down, that you've given to us, make us submitted to it, and find great joy in being doers of your word. We ask in Christ's name, amen. 
Well, we again, we are in the final week of Jesus' life. Jesus, at this point, is headed toward the cross. Two days previous to this, Jesus entered into Jerusalem. The day before this moment, Jesus cleared out the temple, condemning it as a place of self-promotion rather than what it was meant to be, a house of worship. And then we have this day, day three. Jesus returns and the religious leaders show up to ask a series of questions. And of course, they're not doing this for the purpose of receiving the truth, but purely for the pure purpose of making Jesus slip up in something he says. Now, last week, we began in the end of chapter 11 and verse 27, and this is where the whole situation begins. The religious leaders approach Jesus to find out where uh, he gets this authority to be able to condemn the whole temple. After Jesus responds in a way that shuts them up at the, at the end of verse 12 of chapter 12, then more false religious leaders come at him again, but this time with what they think are bazooka-type questions, ones that, and ones that are conundrums to them, and they come from every sect of Jewish leaders. In verse 13, we see that the Pharisees and the Herodians come, then verse 18, the Sadducees, and then finally in verse 28, a scribe. And again, we can see in chapter 12, verse 13, the reason they are doing this. Look at it there in verse 13. Then they sent some Pharisees and Herodians <coughs> excuse me, to, trap, uh, to him in order to trap him in a statement. So this is a series of tests to trap Jesus. They are fishermen who are dangling a treat on a hook hoping for Jesus to take a bite, and then they got him. One by one, they come. Three traps, three deadly hooks, three very different subjects, in each case reflecting the particular expertise or sort of hobby horse of each group, the Sadducees with the Herodians on taxation, the Sadducees on the resurrection, and the scribes on the law. But Jesus takes on each question, takes on each challenge, and brilliantly turns it back on them to expose their unbelief to the degree that when they finally arrest Jesus, it will be obvious that it is personal and evil rather than logical, rational, biblical, or even legal. Now, the way I've been couching all of this, as you know, and is there in the sermon notes in front of you, is that Jesus is exposing their unbelief. Jesus knows these questions are not to seek for true answers, but for the purpose of condemning Jesus. And so Jesus just turns that right back around on them. And we need to see then the nature. We need to understand the pathology, if you will, the disease of unbelief. Last week in Mark chapter 11, verse 27 through 12, 12, we saw four um, uh, uh, pathologies, if you will, to uh, unbelief. And that is that unbelief questions Jesus' authority, his lordship. Unbelief refuses to acknowledge the obvious. Unbelief hates God's messengers. And unbelief fulfills the scriptures, uh, meaning they're not out of control in that sense. Now, as we continue, we're going to see, starting in verse 13, as the Pharisees and Herodians come to Jesus, we're going to find out that unbelief will not honor God. It will not honor God. Look at it in verse 13 down through, well, I'll stop at a certain point. Then they send some Pharisees and Herodians to him in order to trap him in a statement. They came and said to him, teacher, we know that you are truthful and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God and truth. Is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? Stop there. So the Pharisees and Herodians come to Jesus about this question of a poll tax. 
Now, first, this, as one commentator put it, is a very awkward alliance. The Pharisees were purists when it came to the Mosaic law. The law for the Pharisees was to be followed unbendingly and strictly literally. These were the most devout of all the religious leaders. Whereas the Herodians were essentially the political Jews of the day and were called Herodians because they supported King Herod Antipas in all that he did. Didn't matter what he did, they supported it. So the Jews, uh, though they were Jews who grew up going to, uh, under the Old Testament law and in uh, uh, schools, uh, Hebrew school, and they were sort of religious, they were the least religious of all the religious leaders. And they were the least concerned about actually following the Old Testament law. These groups should not coexist and certainly have never been friends. The Pharisees cared about the law of God. The Herodians cared about the law of Rome. The Pharisees devoted their life to Israel's spiritual welfare, while the Herodians cared about the political leanings of Israel. The Pharisees were opposed to all things Rome, while the Herodians were in favor of all things Rome. The Pharisees wanted Rome out. The Herodians wanted more of Rome in Israel. So you can see, these two groups should never be allies. They both despised one another. However, as the ancient idiom goes, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. The Pharisees opposed Jesus because he contradicted their interpretation of the law of God, an interpretation that was wrong and should have been opposed and was by Jesus. And he also opposed their works righteousness system. Jesus is their enemy. The Herodians opposed Jesus because of his popularity with the people, which makes him a potential threat to Herod's reign and Rome. So both groups had a reason to be rid of Jesus, and they formed this unnatural, awkward alliance against Jesus here. And you can even see in verse 14, you can hear their hatred for Jesus in trying to butter him up and flatter him, though they do not mean a word of what they said. I mean, look at it. All the things they say are true of Jesus, but not to them. Teacher is a term that of honor, and it was only reserved for the rabbis. But these men did not view Jesus that way. They hated him. This is flattery. We know that you are truthful. Again, this is a true statement, but they don't believe it. Remember, back in Mark 3, these religious leaders said that Jesus was satanically empowered. They don't believe he's truthful at all, but more flattery. You defer to no one. You are not partial to any. Again, true. But in their case, this was meant to say, Jesus, you believe that you are right, so right, that you have no reason to talk to about anybody else's authority or even equivocate or change. More flattery. And finally, you teach the way of God and truth. Uh, again, they don't believe this, even though it's true. So they just, they just heap on pile after pile of this extreme praise, but it's all just lip service, a, a lip service that Jesus later condemns in, in Matthew chapter 23, in which he says, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. These guys didn't mean a word of what they said. They're just trying to butter up Jesus. So they asked this question. Is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? It's a fine question, by the way. Uh, if they didn't have other motives, this would actually be a pretty decent question. And it's honestly one we all need to consider at some point. And though this is not the time for it, and nor the text for it, 
Um, just let me say a couple brief words on it. I would say that the scripture teaches that civil authority is an expression of the common grace of God. Even wicked governments provide some benefits to their citizens. Military might be provided for peace and security and protection. Roads are built for transportation of goods. Regulations help keep costs down. Well, they're supposed to. Courts, judges, laws all slow down the evil that would run rampant. The collection of taxes helps fund all of these that are God-ordained means for citizens' protection and their well-being. Some governments are better at it than others. So, in, in a very general way, government is a good thing. In fact, it's an institution of God. It is set up by God. If you'll remember when we looked at the covenants back last summer, it is a co- or in the, uh, excuse me, in, around Christmas time, that God set up government in the Noahic covenant for the good of people. And the New Testament also believes the same, seen clearly in Romans 13 and 1 Peter chapter 2. Submitting to our government is the right thing to do. Unless when the government commands something contrary to Scripture or it violates their God-given sphere of oversight. That's all I want to say at this point. Okay, more could be said and has been. If you need resources on this, on how to think through God and govern biblically, I'd be happy to give you some resources. I even wrote some down here in my notes. If you want them later, please let me know. I'd be happy to point you in that direction. But the point here is to just simply say that the government is is a good grace of God in its proper when it's or in its proper place, and it is good to wrestle with how God wants you and I, as the people of God, to interact and fund the secular government. Now, what happens here in our text? The Pharisees and the Herodians ask, is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? The tax in view here is, as it says, a poll tax. This is an imperial tax, and it was the newest of the taxes that was imposed upon Israel as it was first instituted in about AD 6. The amount was a denarius, which is the average daily wage in Palestine. I have a picture of a denarius uh, front and back there. Um, This tax was, uh, this is an actual picture of the coin, by the way, because they found a whole lot of these. Uh, This tax was not a tax on land and goods. Rather, it is a tax on simply, ready, for existing. It's a person tax. It was imposed because... It was opposed by Caesar because it implied that Caesar owned them and as their God, they should pay tribute to him. It's kind of gross sounding, isn't it? Sickening. And you can understand then why the Jews despised this tax as well as Rome. Furthermore, as you can see on the coin there, a denarius was a silver coin and bared, who bore the image of Tiberius Caesar with the abbreviated inscription around it. It's kind of worn off on one side there. But it, in, Lat, in Latin, it says, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Augustus. Remember, the Caesars believed themselves to be gods. And then on the back with that lady that's sitting there in the chair... That's the image of his mother, Livia, with the inscription Pontifex Maximus, meaning high priest. The point is the people, that is all the people, resented the presence of Rome, resented taxation without representation, and they resented this particular tax because you who exist as a mere individual are going to pay because you exist. They hated it. And so many revolts happened in Israel over taxation, including the final one that began in AD 66, which eventually led to the absolute destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. It was over taxes. So if you're, you're frustrated about taxes, you're not the first one. So it's a very hot button topic for these guys. 
And it was the intention of these men to put Jesus in such a dilemma that his popularity among the people would end, or he would say, don't pay the poll tax, and then Rome would arrest and imprison him as an insurrectionist. (laughs) Support for taxation would discredit him in the eyes of the taxpayers, Whereas the refusal to pay the tax would provide occasion to bring the Roman imperial down on him. This this is a tough spot, right? You and I would be like, oh no. But Jesus, as usual, is unfazed. Look at verse 15. But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. In other words, y'all are not seeking the truth and any kind of an honest answer. You are seeking to kill me. He just puts it right out there. He knows the intentions of these men, of their hearts. Nothing is hidden from the eyes of our Lord. But they did what he said. They brought one verse 16 they brought one and this is super ironic you know we may just pass over this but this is really ironic because it means they had one in their possession which number one the pharisees in particular taught that this was a violation having his face stamped into a coin was a violation of the second command as it bore the image of an idol and secondly it, because it bore the image of an idol, it was forbidden in the temple, according to the Pharisees. And yet, here it is. <laughs> they were able to produce one, showing that they are a lot more complicit than they come off. But look what Jesus says to them, verse 16. Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were amazed at him. Is being taxed valid? Is it proper for citizens, regardless of their religious affiliation, to pay taxes? Of course. Give to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar. He made this coin. His image is on it. It's his property, even though it's in circulation and it's used by the citizens, but his face is on it. His image bears it. It's his. Therefore, return it to him. Even God's people need to do that. And this is further actually understood by Jesus' verbiage. Jesus uses the word apodidomi, which it was translated render here. The word didomi just simply means to give, but with the preposition attached to it, apo, it it intensifies the word to give up or to yield or, or better to pay or fulfill like repaying a debt that's owed. So give it back is kind of the idea. It's actually, the apodidomy is actually used the same way in the parable of the Good Samaritan where you remember the Samaritan uh, tells the innkeeper to take care of the beaten man whom he rescued and spend whatever is needed to take care of him. And when the Samaritan returns, I will apodidomy, I will repay, I will give back to you what is owed. It's also used uh, like this in reference to Jesus' return when Jesus will repay each according to his deeds. So it is right and even necessary for Jews and Gentiles alike to give what is owed. In fact, it's an obligation to do such. And the Apostle Paul um, also makes this point in Romans chapter 13 for Christians. Render to all what is due to them, talking about the government. Tax to whom taxes due, custom to custom, fear to fear, honor to honor. Now here comes the brilliance of Jesus. Jesus also says, and to God, the things that are God's. So yes, the image of Caesar is on your coin and therefore belongs to him. Give it back to him. But human beings bear the image of God. Therefore, human being, 
You belong to God. Give to him. Render to him. Repay your obligation back to him what is owed, which is your life, your loyalty, your worship, your obedience, your reverence, your life. J.C. Ryle again Uh, commenting on this section says, Jesus bids the proud not to refuse his dues to Caesar and not to refuse his dues to God. I mean, do you see what Jesus is exposing here? See how smart this is? None of these men honored God as they should. They squabbled over issues of temporary significance while ignoring major issues. You owe your life to God because you're made in his image. And you're not living that way. You think you know how to, you you think only how to please yourself, how to honor yourself, how to keep yourself out of trouble with the government. But you are made after God's image and therefore you belong to God. You should be asking, how does God want me to live rather than how do I want myself? to live. And this would have been very easy to discern because God made it clear in Deuteronomy 6, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. But the heart of unbelief does not seek this. They seek to honor self and raise self above all else. It believes that they have made themselves after their own image, that they are their own blank slate in which they can write their own story, and therefore they're permitted to pursue their own desires. They repay back to themselves, themselves. But that is, to God, rebellion, just like keeping Caesar's money would be stealing. God is their creator, and they owe their lives to him. The Apostle Paul actually talks about this in Romans 1. He says, and talking about unbelievers, even though they knew God, they did not honor God or him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man themselves. Honor self. Look after self. That is the heart of unbelief. Self is everything. Protect self. Think of self. Self Self-care. It is, in reality, Worship of self. And God better get in line. But that's what unbelief is. It does not honor God. Well, this shut them down. And they, all they could do is be amazed because of the profound wisdom and simplicity of the response. Yet again, no faith is found because of stubborn unbelief. They won't honor God why would they honor his son? So this leads then to our second interaction, which is found beginning in verse 18. And here I'll just call this unbelief is ignorant of the scriptures. I probably should have said willfully ignorant of the scriptures. And I'll show you why that here in just a second. I try not to make these points too long that I end up being a Puritan who make like massive long. Anyway, some of you know what I'm talking about. All right, verse 18, unbelief is ignorant. So behind the Pharisees then becomes this other religious group known as the Sadducees. Now outside of the Pharisees, who also included some scribes, or some of the scribes were Pharisees, the Sadducees were next in being the most influential in Israel. They were few in number, but they had a considerable influence. They were made up of the wealthy and the connected. They were the um, religious aristocrat Jews. They held the highest religious position, the high priest, and they also made up, even though few in number, the majority of the great Sanhedrin. Now, though they were Jews, their highest agenda was still to Rome. The reason for this is because of the base belief of the rejection of the afterlife. 
The Sadducees did not believe in any resurrection like the Pharisees and scribes taught. And so they had to get what they could out of this life, pursuing power and position and control and money. And the only way that they were going to do this at this time in the first century was to cooperate with Rome. Had they lived in the 21st century America, they would be all in on American ideals while mishandling the scriptures to justify their own actions and manipulate people. They would still be pastors in churches, but their teaching would be political and social. You know people like this today. This partnership with Rome which was therefore corrupt because politics led them more of the scriptures is what caused the Jewish people in general to despise the Sadducees, though not to the degree as the Herodians. Now, the important part, as I mentioned a moment ago, is to, is to understand their ardent denial of the resurrection, which is the topic they bring to Jesus. The reason they denied the resurrection, as well as things like angels and the age to come, was because they rejected all Old Testament writing except for Moses' writing, which ends up being the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All other writings, including the oral law of the Pharisees, they were viewed as subordinate and at best a commentary on Moses' writings but was certainly not the word of God and therefore not authoritative and not binding. In Moses' writings then, they argued that you could not find teaching on the resurrection. Therefore, it's not there. And they believed in the doctrine of annihilation, which teaches that when the body dies, the soul also dies this life is the only one you get. There are no rewards for good. There's no punishment for bad after you die. So get all you can get now, folks. <clears throat> if this sounds a little like humanism and evolution, uh, it's, it's that. Humanism and evolution are just old compared to what these guys were already believing. But here we're reminded again that there's nothing new under the sun. You know, when people reject God's truth, they only and ever come up with the same old thing. Generation after generation, just call it something else. And it always lacks hope. It always lacks joy because the things of this world, even things like power and money and control and pleasure, they cannot fulfill. They constantly disappoint. Only God's truth, only God's way can satisfy the heart, even in this cursed world. Now, that gives us a little bit of background to help what's going on in our text. And here's where we got it. Verse 18, look at it there. Some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and began questioning him, saying, Teacher, and again, more flattery, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children for his brother. So the Sadducees are referring to Deuteronomy 25 concerning Leverite marriage. If a husband dies, God has made provision to keep the inheritance, specifically the land, within the tribe. So if a man dies and has no living sons, then the family, that is the next single brother of the deceased husband, was obligated to marry the widow and take care of her land and give her children, specifically boys, so that the inheritance could continue through the family. If you want to read more on this, you can go read the command in Deuteronomy 25. You can also see it practically worked out in the book of Ruth, as well as in Genesis 38 in the story of Onan. So the scenario here is presented. Here's a married couple. The husband dies, no sons. The next of kin needs to step up. And there's no problems at this point. But check this out. Verse 20. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife and leaving no children. The second one married her and died leaving behind no children. And the third likewise. And so all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman died also. <laughs> this, is, this is weird. It's so bizarre. It's so strange. But, I mean, I guess it's possible. So what's the point? Verse 23. In the resurrection, when they rise again, talking about all of these people, 
which, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. <laughs> okay. You see, the Sadducees, who don't believe in a resurrection anyway, have found a situation that seems so far-fetched that there's no way that Jesus is going to be able to answer this because, again, in their minds, if there is a resurrection, then this woman's going to have seven husbands. For these men, this takes away any chance of resurrection because it violates Genesis 1 and 2, one man and one woman marriage. So see, it's even a Bible argument. What will Jesus say? Verse 24, Jesus says to them, is this not the reason you are mistaken? That you do not understand the scriptures or the power of God? <laughs> Before Jesus even gets to their question, Jesus immediately goes after, again, the real problem. Jesus indicts them for their ignorance. That is, Though they pride themselves on knowing the writing of Moses, they do not have a clue what they're talking about. You, you don't even understand. Here, they believe they've got Jesus on the ropes, when in reality, Jesus shows their complete incompetence in even the scriptures they claim to know, proving as he has done with the Pharisees, that they are unqualified to be teachers in Israel. And besides just from ignorance of the scriptures, they don't even know the power of God, which is crazy because remember in Exodus, God delivered his people from the Egyptians by the power of God, but they don't even believe in that power of God to deliver, to deliver a soul back to its body. I mean, they're just... They have completely ignored, and this is why I say that it should be willing ignorance to the scriptures. They've completely ignored the Bible texts and displays of God's power, even his creative power from Genesis 1 to create something out of nothing. Why have they done this? Well, it's, it's pretty simple because it interferes with their way of life. They are so caught up in their way of life, their wealth, their prestige, their connection, their clout, their lifestyle, their popularity with Rome. They're unwilling to even understand the simplest things of the Bible. They intentionally and willfully keep themselves ignorant so they can live how they please, all the while saying that they are the experts of it. It's so backwards and so sad. But such is the case with the unbelieving heart. They actually want their ignorance. And they also want you to know that they know more than you when they don't. I mean, you can show them time and time again what God has clearly stated in Scripture, but they will be unwilling they may engage you with an odd scenario in order to prove their expertise on how well they've thought through this, like what these guys have done here. But they don't care about the answer. They care about making you look like a fool, like Jesus looking like a fool, which they've already decided is the case, no matter what his answer is. And what's interesting is the question they propose actually shows their ignorance to what they claim they know. And, and you, you, you've seen this. I've seen it time and time again. Unbelievers who try to corner believers about the sovereignty of God or about the problem of evil or was Jesus really a historical person or was the resurrection a true historical fact or who defines morality anyway and many other questions. And they think they've got Christians in a chokehold with no way out but to admit that God has no way to explain himself. The problem is is that when an articulate biblical answer follows, which is what Jesus is going to do here, they are shown their ignorance. But they don't repent. They just continue to show that they don't care. 
They have no desire to repent and believe. They just want to make you look stupid. They want to make your belief look foolish. They don't want your answer. They don't want God, and and they're going to walk away anyway. And, And again, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to be persuasive in your answers to people. It's a great thing to engage people with all kinds of answers to their questions about what God has clearly revealed. But you have to understand that when you engage with the unbelieving heart, most of the time, though, they seem confident and smart in their answers as if they've thought all the way through it. If they're not believing the clear word of God, there is a willing ignorance on their part. And your answer is not going to resolve that. You and I must rely upon the grace of God to open their eyes and soften their hearts. Yes, be faithful. Yes, be biblical. Yes, be gospel-centered in all of your answers to unbelievers and their conundrums. But you have to leave the change to God. He'll change them in time and by his way. Now, what does Jesus answer? Verse 25. For when they rise from the dead, oh, excuse me. Jesus said to them, verse 24. Oh, I just did 24, 25. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, that God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. (laughs) What an incredible answer. It's so simple. Here Jesus gives two answers. First, verse 25, marriage is only for this present life. There's no need for sex and reproduction because no one's going to die. And there will be no individual families to maintain in heaven because there's only going to be one relationship between all the glorified saints, which will be perfect joy and perfect love. You won't need families to hand the truth down from generation to generation since everyone will be in perfect union with God and will be true for all of eternity. There will be no need for marriage partners to complement one another because everybody is going to be complete in Christ. So the point in verse 25 is to say that the Sadducees misunderstand the purpose of marriage and family relationships in this life. Here, the experts of Moses' writings, and therefore Genesis 1 and 2, don't understand why God created marriage and family. They are needed to fill the population, to pass on truth, and to point to the character of God. None of that will be needed in heaven because everyone in heaven will be perfect and will be in perfect union with God and with one another. So they show their ignorance. And then the second answer is in verses 26 and 27. Jesus quotes from Exodus chapter 3, in which the text says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So if these guys are dead, God is the God of the dead. But that's not true. God is the God of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have already died in this life, and yet God uses the present tense verb concerning their living. Ergo, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, must be alive. And since they're alive, either they have already been raised in resurrected bodies or their spirits await resurrected bodies. Did you track all that? It's really smart. And it's a fairly simple argument. And, you know, the most brilliant ones usually are. Here are the patriarchs of your faith who God says are living, not were living at some point, but are living right now, present tense. Therefore, the resurrection has already happened or they're waiting for it to come. If the Sadducees were right, then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are dead and gone and God 
is greatly mistaken for using a present tense verb. But they did not believe that God misspoke. They believed all of the Moses writings as God's word. Therefore, they must be alive. And he is their God. And it is therefore the Sadducees who are greatly mistaken. And that is the key to this interaction. Unbelief believes that they are completely right and that either the Bible, God, or Christians are the mistaken ones, are the ones that are off their rocker, are the ones that are cuckoo in the head. The reality is, though, though they may be smart, their unbelief actually leaves them to be the ones who are greatly mistaken. And this interaction with Jesus proves again that God's word is completely reliable in all of its parts, even to the degree of the verb tenses. I like that. In another interaction in John 10, Jesus makes a case against these religious leaders about their ignorance, and it was based upon one word in Psalm 82, to which then he declared, the scriptures cannot be broken. Every word in the Bible is God's word. It is from him. He does not tell lies. And not one word, not one tense can be removed or altered. This is the truth. That is the strong foundation we stand upon. And that is why the Bible is still the best answer to any question, even in the face of unbelieving ignorance, because this is the only book that can lead people to eternal life in Christ. Well, we have time for one more, and it's quick, because it's really obvious what's going on. And that is this, unbelief does not love God. Verse 28, one of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognizing he had answered them well, asked him, what commandment is the foremost of all? That's a great question. Is there a commandment given by God that can summarize the law and give a clear, definable, simple understanding of how the people of God are to live their lives? Like really simply. Now, before I get to the, under, the answer, just understand what Jesus is dealing with at this point. Historical rabbinical teachings show that this was a much debated topic. <laughs> Feels like everything's debated, right? The Old Testament law of Moses had 613 laws. The rabbis divided these laws into positive affirmations and negative prohibitions. They further divided the laws into heavy laws and light laws, meaning some were absolute while others um, could be or were less binding and there wasn't anything that was generally wrong with doing this. Some laws could be flexed depending on the situation. And this was allowed by God in the law. While other laws were non-negotiable and needed to be followed to the letter. In fact, in Matthew 23, 23, Jesus condemns the scribes and Pharisees for putting too much weight on some laws and not on some other ones that they should be. So again, this division is fine and sometimes helpful. However, throughout all the rabbis' discussion, no consensus was ever made about which commandment was the greatest. And so they just kept focusing on keeping the others and deciding, though wrongly, which commandments were to be obeyed. And then they created an oral law to try to keep the ones that were more weighty and all that. And they just kept heaping laws and burdens on people. So by the time this question arises, it is highly contested, highly controversial, and very personal. And yet, Jesus answers with perfection, accuracy, and without hesitation. Verse 29, Jesus answered, the foremost is, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The most basic foundational truth that every Jewish boy and girl learns is Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. It's known as the Shema. Shema is the Hebrew word for a verb translated to hear, which is the first word of that verse. This verse the great Shema is 
even today, still recited daily by religious Jews and as part of the Sabbath synagogue worship. Why this verse? Well, remember that Deuteronomy was given by Moses to the second generation of Hebrews who were saved from Egyptian enslavement. Moses gave the people a series of sermons, which became the book of Deuteronomy, to the people reminding them of what God requires of them. And at the end of chapter 5 of Deuteronomy, and just listen here, at the end of chapter 5 of Deuteronomy, Moses says this, So you shall observe to do just as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right or to the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you that you may live, that it may be well with you, that you may prolong your days in the land which you possess. That was what they were told to do. How are they going to do this? Well, that's why they were supposed to repeat the great Shema. The way you're going to accomplish this task is to love the Lord your God. That is, you are to be devoted to him above all else. And it's not to be merely done with external actions with all your might, but it shall be done internally as well. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul. In other words, the totality of your being, everything you are, everything you feel, everything you do, everything you think should be for one purpose. It's because you love God, because you're devoted to him. This call for love is not just found here, but Moses repeats it seven more times in Deuteronomy. And even Joshua at the end of his life repeats it and puts it into Joshua 23. Devotion to God is the greatest commandment from God. And no, this isn't perfection. This is not perfect obedience is the greatest commandment. No, commitment to God, his person, his ways, his purposes is the greatest. None of us are going to be perfect. God didn't expect perfect obedience. That's why perfect obedience is not the requirement. The command is to be devoted to him above all else. Even when you fail, come back to the Lord. And Jesus doesn't stop there because... If he stopped there, then we would all end up secluding ourselves to focus only on God. And so Jesus makes sure that they understand the inseparable command of Leviticus 19, verse 31. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. My friends, these two are linked. You can't if you can't love others, you don't understand God and therefore are not devoted to God. For he is love and he has shown you his love and therefore you must show it to others. This understanding actually makes itself all the way into the church. You know this text, 1 John 4, 20. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. These are not separated. They're either both true or neither one are true. And you already know what this love looks like because it's love your neighbor as yourself. My friends, you already love yourself. You take care of yourself. You anticipate your own physical needs. That's a priority in your life. So in the same way, love others, including Matthew 5, your enemies. And in this love for others, you actually show yourself truly devoted to God. Well, what's the reaction from the scribe on this answer? Verse 32, the scribe said to him, right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one. There is no one else beside him. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. In other words, the scribe acknowledges that the Sanhedrin have fallen into Jesus' trap. <laughs> They could not win against his answers, answers because every one of them is biblical and logical and true. He, he exegeted the scriptures perfectly. 
and in doing so shows that he honors God and he understands the scriptures and he loves God. What they have showed in their unbelief, Jesus has modeled in his life and they despise them for it because they have unbelieving hearts. What's interesting is this last verse in our section. um, I'll just read it to you. When Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to them, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. (laughs) We don't have a record what happened to this scribe. Was he like the rich young ruler in Mark 10 who turned his back on Christ? Or was he like Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea who were both in the Sanhedrin and yet they believed in Jesus as Savior and Lord? We're not going to know till heaven. Yet we see that the Bible answers to the unbeliever stimulates truth and then possible belief. This then becomes, again, an excellent example from our Lord on why apologetics from the Bible is the best method. Because the Bible answers all of our heart's deepest questions. And if we will believe its truth, it will soothe and rest other people's souls when we present it. John Piper says, we battle unbelief by the book of God, the spirit of God, and the promises of God. Jesus taught in Matthew 24, no one can serve two masters. He'll either hate one or love the other, or he'll be devoted to one or despise the other. For the unbelieving heart, they pay some level of lip service to God, maybe, but their love and affection and devotion is always toward other things, mainly themselves. They seek their own way, their own pleasure, and if God fits in here and there, then fine. But that's not true belief. It's masked, nice, unbelief. That may fool people, but it doesn't fool God. Either you're devoted to God and loving him, or you are devoted to self-love. There is no other option. Thankfully, Christ came to save us from our self-love, right? Because we naturally cannot love and be devoted to God on our own. If God does not send Christ to save us from ourselves, we will be lost forever, Yet God did love us. He proved that by sending his son into the world and and died on a cross so that we could be redeemed back to himself by faith in the son of God. And then he'll fill us with a love for God, devotion to God. And once we know the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus, we could never be devoted to anyone else, even if we are imperfect at it. So we've seen in Jesus' conversation with these religious leaders that unbelief questions Jesus' lordship, refuses to acknowledge the obvious, hates God's messengers, will not honor God, is ignorant to the scriptures, and does not love God. It's not about facts and being more convincing than other religions. Rather, it's as D.A. Carson wrote, failure to believe stems from moral failure to recognize the truth. Not from want of evidence, but from willful neglect or a distortion of the evidence. Simply, the unbelieving heart doesn't want God, and therefore we reject any clear evidence to the contrary. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, we need to not only look into our own lives to see if we are unbelieving, but we need to cry out to the Lord that he will open unbelievers' eyes to the truth of their sin and their need for Christ to be their savior. He must open their spiritually blind eyes, soften their spiritually hard hearts and enlighten them to stop rejecting Christ. Yes, keep living for Christ. Yes, keep answering their questions, but cry out to the Lord that they will embrace and follow him with full abandon. Let me pray. Father, thank you for our time in the text today. Again, ever so familiar text that we no doubt have gone over many, many times in our own personal study or in various sermons in the past. 
And yet, Lord, as we look again at fresh eyes, we see the, the, the absolute incapability we have to save people. That must be your work. And yet we desire so much that they would be convinced by what we're convinced by. Because these answers are brilliant and we believe in them and what Jesus said. We've believed because you have brought belief into our lives. You gifted us repentance and faith. And that's why our eyes are open. That's why we see it. And Lord, we desire this so badly for our unbelieving family, our unbelieving friends, maybe our children, grandparents, co-workers. Lord, we know there are unbelievers all around us. We desire them to be saved. Lord, would you do that? Would you accomplish the work that we are incapable of doing? But help us to be faithful, to pray for them, but also to continue to give the word to them. Because it's through your word that they will hear. And by hearing, they'll have faith. Help us to trust you in that and your timing of it. Until then, help us to be faithful to the end. In Jesus' name.